Hallelujah. I am by occupation a behavioral scientist, which what that means is my PhD is in behavioral science, uh, criminology, victimology, sociology, psychology, uh, all the ologies of human behavior. But by vocation, I'm a minister of the gospel. I believe the Bible is the greatest psychology book ever written. I don't read it. It reads me. It exposes the winner in me and it confronts the sinner in me. The image of Adam and the image of God. It's all there. It is the most comprehensive manual on the makeup of who you are. It deals with your social dimension. It deals with your psychological. It deals with the spiritual. It deals with that thing called the soul, the will, the Bible, the greatest psychology book ever written. So if you're here today and you're saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. There's some stuff happening inside of me. I believe the word of God is going to shine some light on that this morning. Amen. If you could stand up with me. Mark's Gospel, Chapter 4. Can we bring up that slide? Do we, are we good with that? Yeah? There we go. Stay right there. Mark 440. Father, we, we thank you for the house of God. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for your word. So many of us in this room have gone through some crisis. We've come out of some storms. So many of us are living on the other side of some disaster. We've come out of the disaster, but the disaster has yet to come out of us. I pray for those that are struggling with PTSD, those that are shell-shocked, those that are even afraid to leave their homes, but they're here today. I pray today, Lord, we wouldn't just come out of the storm. The storm would come out of us. We wouldn't just survive a crisis, but that crisis, we would be delivered from all of its after effects. I pray for those whose brains have been damaged by crisis. I pray today you would heal, restore, put back together. In Jesus' name, amen. Are we ready to read the word of God? Well, before we do, stay standing, please. Thank you. Before we do, two mafia hitmen are walking through the woods of Southbury. And, uh, no, they're in Southbury, you know, they're there, they're from the Bronx, but they're in Southbury doing what they do. And they're in the woods, and a lot of holes in those woods. And one mafia hitman says, the other mafia hitman, he says, it's scary walking through these backwoods. Because I, I, mean, I know I'm supposed to be brave and everything, but man, this is scary stuff. The other mafia hitman says, how do you think I feel? I gotta walk back alone. How many have survived some narrow escapes, some very close calls? Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, is a close call. It is a narrow escape. Now, most of the time we hear this story, we hear about the storm. But this morning, I want to talk to you about what happens after the storm. Somebody say, the storm is over. After the storm, after Jesus has quieted the winds, after he's spoken authority over every adversity. Now he looks at the disciples. I'm so glad that he doesn't just speak to the storm on the sea, but he speaks to the storm in me. He spoke to the storm, now he's speaking to the souls. And he says to the disciples, he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Father, anoint this word. I pray again, healing through this word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We have had a several, uh, the last few years, several storms. Globally, nationally, personally. Every one of us on some level has been affected by crisis, crisis personally, crisis collectively, crisis as a church, crisis as a family. In this story, the storm is over. The wind has stopped raging, the boat has stopped shaking, but the disciples' knees have not stopped jerking. 
What do you do when the storm is over in your home, but it's not over in your head? What do you do when the storm is over around you, but it is not over inside of you? You have come out of the crisis, but the crisis has not come out of you. Most of our troubles are not in the unfolding of the calamity. Most of our troubles are in the aftermath of the tragedy. The book of Job, only one chapter describes the unfolding of the calamity. 29 chapters describe the aftermath of the tragedy. I'm so grateful that God doesn't just speak to the storm. He speaks to my soul. Amen? Because the real battle is inside of you. The real battle is in your mind. It's over in your home, but it's still not over in your head. Somebody say, the storm is over. We need a little help believing this, amen? We need a little help in believing this. The Bible says the disciples are paralyzed by fear. I'm not talking about the kind of fear that you have, the emotion of fear. We all have emotions of fear. Paul said when he preached to the people, he came in fear, in trembling. He was shaking. Every one of you are going to learn how to do things afraid. When Jeanette wrote the book and she published the book, I'm sure she did it with her knees shaking. When I preach the gospel, every time I stand on this platform, there's a little palpitation of the heart. There's fear. It's one thing to have fear. It's another thing for fear to have you. A spirit of fear. A paralysis. Stuck. Paul says to Timothy, God has not given you, not the emotion of fear, He has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. The disciples, fear has them. Now listen, there are 252 psychotic disorders and neurotic disorders listed in the DSM. That's the psychiatric manual. 252. The common denominator between all Neurotic and psychotic disorders between all neurosis and psychosis is this word fear. It is the common denominator. This, this fear, this, this reticence, this re reservation, this anxiety that what happened then, any second it's going to happen again. We call it PTSD. We're all living on the other side of some storm. Do you know every one of you have been affected by trauma on some level? I'm going to prove it. God said this to Adam about the fall. He said, because of your fall, childbirth. The, the birthing of a child will be agonizing. It will be traumatizing. For nine months, you were comfortable inside your mother's womb. I mean, it was the only world you knew. If you had it your way, you'd still be in that womb 42 years later, some of you still have not left the womb, living in mom's basement. Well, that's another sermon. <laughs> some of you parents are like, yes, preach that. <laughs> Parenthood, the scariest hood that I've ever driven through. I mean, I've been through Detroit. My stepfather who raised me is from the Bronx, grew up in Providence in the projects. I know many hoods, but there's no hood scarier than parenthood. Trauma. Somebody say the trauma of parenthood. You will be beat up, left for dead, stripped naked by your own kinfolk, bleeding on a sidewalk, begging for help. Child abuse. We need to talk about parent abuse. Child abuse was the 80s and the 90s. We've come into parent abuse. No, listen, it's still the reality of child abuse. I'm, I'm not making light of that. But trauma, listen, you were traumatized at birth. Nine months, you were in your mother's womb. You thought it was the only world you knew. There you were. It took some pushing to get you out of that thing, right? You come out. What happens? You go from the womb into the world, and the first thing you do, ah! Somebody say, all of life is trauma. 
It's trauma all through life. So fear becomes something that is not intentional. It becomes something that's instinctual. Faith is intentional. Faith is in effort. Faith is a work of the will. James says, without works, there's no faith. But fear, fear is instinctual. It's hardwired into your DNA. And we're living on edge, living on high alert, waiting for the next shooting, waiting for the next storm, anticipating that what happened then, any second, it's going to happen again. How many can relate to this? How many can relate to this dropping your kids off at the school bus? You can relate to this. That will it happen again? What just happened then? Is it going to happen again? A woman is burglarized when she's a little girl. A burglar breaks into the home, robs everything. She's startled out of her sleep. Forty years, she's waiting for the burglar to come back. She gets married. Poor guy. He hears every night before he goes to bed. Did you lock the doors? I locked the doors. Lock the windows. I locked the windows. Forty years. There's a dog standing at post. The dog's at post. Is everything secure? Everything secure. Forty years. Wakes up one night. He's going to the bathroom. It's dark. Bumps into a burglar. He smiles. Extends his hand. He says, pleasure to meet you. <laughs> he says, please go upstairs. Introduce yourself to my wife. She's been waiting to meet you for 40 years. <laughs> waiting. Most of the stuff that you're worried about doesn't even materialize. Yet we wait. We're waiting for what happened then. At any second, it's going to happen again. Now, even if the stuff you're worried about doesn't ever happen, just the anticipation. We know from hooking people's brains up to fMRIs, difference between an fMRI and an MRI. Is an MRI, you can see the structure of the brain. fMRI, you can see the function of neurotransmitters. Under that fMRI, we can see people's cortisol levels, which is the stress hormone. People's cortisol is higher in anticipating the problem than in the unfolding of the problem. God doesn't want to just give you eternal life. He wants to give you the abundant life. He did not call you to be stressed. He called you to be blessed. He called you to live this life not just surviving but thriving. I pray that today he would begin to put back in order your brain so that you can live in the freedom he's called you to live. And you won't go there until you get there. Somebody say, don't go there till you get there. That's not me. That's a woman named Jeanette Willis, and she's having a book launch this week. <laughs> don't go there till you get there. I might steal that, take it on the road. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I, let me give you a little division of your brain. Here's just some neuroscience. We have any scientists in the house? Anybody that likes science? I'll, I'll make it simple for those of you that don't like science. Your brain is divided into two parts. When God designed you, he created you for survival. He knew that life is not a playground. Life is a battleground. So he designed you that you and I would survive. We wouldn't just survive, but we would thrive. Our brains can be divided really into two parts. There's an analyst in you, and there's an animal in you. The analyst is the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that balances the checkbook, fixes the lawnmower. When the lawnmower is broke, it's the part of your brain that solves problems, the analyst. We all have an analyst inside of us. Somebody say, don't lose your head. The Bible acknowledges the analyst. When Paul speaks of joy in Philippians, he doesn't say, feel these things. He says, think upon these things. He's appealing to the rational part of you. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, the analyst, your mind, and your strength. Somebody say, don't lose your head. Don't lose your head over your prodigal son. Don't lose your head over your Jezebel girlfriend. Don't lose your head. There's an analyst in you, but there's also an animal in you. The animal is the limbic system. It's the instinctual part of you. It's that part of you that if a car is coming at 50 miles per hour, there's an instinct that kicks in. It says flight. It says get out of the way. The analyst is not swift enough to respond to the oncoming traffic. You need the animal, the instinctual part of you. When you get saved, 
You may be a warrior in the world, but you become a warrior in his kingdom. The animal doesn't die. It gets sanctified. It comes under the leading of God, and he will use the analyst in you, and he will use the animal in you. Amen? David was an animal at certain points in the Old Testament. There was a warrior inside of him. It was an instinctual part of him. Jesus many times was instinctual, in other cases logical. God designed us so that the analyst would lead the way and the animal is on standby. The analyst, day-to-day operations, the animal, the crisis. The problem is when you and I go through enough crisis, we go through enough trauma, we endure enough storms, now what happens is we don't live in the analyst mode, we live in the analyst mode and every circumstance feels like a crisis because you come out of the crisis but the crisis hasn't come out of you that's where these disciples are they're out of the storm but they still feel like the storm is happening they're living in animal mode everything feels threatening when the animal is taken over and the analyst is put to sleep, yeah, we can see this in brain activity. We can see people that have gone through enough trauma. PTSD is not a disorder as much as it is a reorder, a reorder of the brain where someone is living constantly in survival mode, anticipating crisis, anticipating that what just happened then, any second, Domestic violence is going to happen again, and my next will treat me just like my ex, and there's something in me that's expecting the problems then are going to happen again. I don't know what I'm talking about. To some degree, we're all there as a country. We're there, the fear, the fear of, of, of waiting for what happened then, and any second is going to happen again. This, this city boy moves to the country, and he moves next door to a farmer. He don't know anything about farms, country, animals. It's all new to him. He's, he's living next door to a farmer. He's sleeping peacefully in his bed. 3 a.m., he hears a sound. Rooster crowing. He jumps out of his seat, out of his sleep. He can't sleep. For one week, he has insomnia, can't sleep, knocks on the farmer's door. He says to the farmer, he says, I'm packing my bags. I'm going back to the city. He says, your rooster, it kept me up all night, every night this week. The farmer says, that's impossible. He says, he crows one time, and he only crows for five minutes. He says, oh, but I toss and I turn, waiting all night for the cock to crow. What are you tossing and turning right now, waiting? God wants to fix that anticipating thing in you. What are you asking for? What are you imagining? You think about your future. What are you envisioning? I thank God he doesn't give us what we can ask and what we can imagine. He gives us more than we can ask and more than we can imagine because my asker and imagine is broke. If he gives me what I'm asking for and he gives me what I'm imagining, my imagination runs wild. It takes me to some very dark places. God says, i got to give you more than what you can ask for because you're far too easily pleased. You are expecting norms that I never called you to live to. And you, your, imagina, your imagination is too dark. So I'm going to give you more than what you can ask for and more than what you could possibly imagine. I pray God fixes your expector this morning, that anticipator inside of you, that he would deliver you from that spirit, that that paralysis of fear. You're stuck waiting for the problems of yesterday to happen again today. The disciples are out of the storm, but the storm is still inside their minds. It's still happening inside of them. I want to deal with this fear on two levels. There are two remedies in the scriptures to deal with fear. Two remedies. The first one is here in this passage in Mark 4. The second one is in 1 John 4. 1 John 4 says, perfect love casts out all fear. Mark 4 says, where's your faith? If you had faith, you wouldn't have any fear. When the faith is high, the fear is low. When the love is high, the fear is low. When the faith is low, the fear is high. 
When the love is low, the fear is high. Two remedies to cure you of all anxiety. Love in faith. Love in faith. Somebody say love in faith. Let's talk about both of these. 1 John chapter 4, the apostle says perfect love. It casts out all fear. Live in perfect love. That perfect love cannot coexist with fear. Have no love. Love is low. The fear is high. The term perfect, we think of this as flawless. We think, well, that's perfect love. That's divine love compared to human love. And human love is flawed. And human love, you need less human love. You need more divine love. And if you live in divine love and less human love, you'll have no fear. That's not what it means. The term perfect doesn't mean flawless. It means complete. The very phrase is expounded upon early in the chapter. John says, his love is perfected in us as we love one another. Perfect love is complete. It's a complete circuit. It's you receiving love from heaven, you extending that love to the brethren. It is love in worship, but it is also love in fellowship. And when you and I live in love in worship, and we live in the love of fellowship, fear cannot reside. So perfect. It's not, well, I need more of God's love. I don't really need people's love. How's that working out for you? Ask Adam how that worked out. Adam had all the love from God a man could possibly have in Genesis chapter 2. I mean, he had unbroken fellowship. He had the longest prayer meeting ever on the planet. The Shekinah glory every second of the day. I don't know what he was doing, but his behavior was so maladjusted that God said, it ain't good for him to be alone. His brother needs a friend. I don't know if he's putting his toes in his nose, if he's hitting his head up against a tree. I don't know if he's talking to himself, talking to the animals, but God said, he needs a friend. You can look at your neighbor and say, I'll be your friend. You say, oh boy, is she going to be my friend? Oh boy. Listen, you're just as messed up as she is. That's why you're here, amen? You spot it, you got it. Right? So we need this perfect love. We need this complete circuit. Because you know what happens when you have a complete circuit? If you study electricity, power only begins to flow when there's complete circuitry. And when you're living in that complete circuitry, the worship, the fellowship, when you forsake not the assembling together, there is a power that begins to flow collectively that you will not find privately. There is a power that drives out all fear. Right now, social workers and clinicians and therapists are overloaded. People's fears are out of control. Why? Two years of isolation. It's not good for you to be alone. Listen, you are so social, and I am so social, that if we were forsaken on an island, we would take a volleyball, paint a face on it, and call it Wilson. And if something should happen to our friend Wilson, Wilson! When we have perfect love, we don't have fear. When we're out of touch with fellowship, Listen, when people are out of touch, they become out of touch. We need touch. We need touch. There's a gland in your brain. The pituitary gland keeps your organs healthy, causes you to grow and to develop. One of the things that activates the pituitary gland is physical touch. Paul knew that when he said, greet one another with a holy kiss. God designed you to be in touch. And when you're out of touch, you become out of touch. Talk to people that have been outside the body of Christ. I mean, just out of touch. Out of touch theologically. Some strange doctrines when they've been out of church too long. I mean, strange, right? Out of touch socially. Don't know how to interact anymore. Afraid of people. You go shake their hand. They back up like you got, the, like you got some kind of disease. Out of touch. Listen, live stream, glad you're watching. I thank God for live stream. And I, I thank God that you're able to see this, where you're seeing this, and there's no judgment, no stones to throw. But the right time that the Lord would lead you back 
into the fellowship. Forsake not the assembling together. You cannot do this alone. You can't do it alone. Austrian psychologist Rene Spritz, when he conducted a study on orphans in an orphanage back in South America where they had no time to hold the babies because the caretakers were suffering from these impoverished conditions, they noticed over the course of time the babies weren't growing. They developed a condition called dwarfism. There are spiritual dwarfs in the body of Christ. They're doing church at home. They're growing, but not really growing. Undeveloped, not coming into the fullness of who they are. Perfect love drives out all fear. When the love is high, the fear is low. Am I talking to anybody here? Anybody with some fears? God's saying, break the isolation. Graft into the body of Christ. Second is faith. Jesus says in Mark 4, where's your faith? Now, faith is one of those tools in the shed that has many usages. It's like the hammer. You can use it all different kinds of jobs. Faith is used in a multiplicity of applications in the New Testament, the Old Testament. All that begs the question, what kind of faith specifically is Jesus speaking of in this passage? All kinds of faith. Paul mentions faith in a variety of ways in the epistles. It's used in the narrative, book of Joshua. In this chapter, in this passage, what kind of faith is Jesus referring to? The word for faith in this verse, it's a Greek word. The derivative of this word is very specific. It's the word pistos. It means evidence that convinces a doubter. What Jesus is really saying is the kind of faith that looks back and sees the evidence. He's saying, where were you a minute ago? You're afraid right now. What are you afraid of? You're living in the rush of the storm. Go back and look at the evidence. You're living in the rush. You're forgetting the hush. You're forgetting the hush was more powerful than the rush. You're remembering the difficulties of your past. You're forgetting the deliverance. That's what PTSD, it's remembering the past a certain way. When I do workshops on PTSD in churches, I do them all the time. Churches, teen challenge centers, the pastors always say to me, almost always, they always say, the problem with these people is they live too much in the past. They think about the past too much. I always say, on the contrary, they're not thinking about the past enough. Because PTSD, you're not thinking about the whole story. You're thinking about just the pain, just the rush, just the violence of the storm. You're forgetting the silence. You're forgetting the deliverance. You're living in the mayhem. You're forgetting the miracles. The real recovery begins when you remember the evidence. You look back at your history and you don't just see a trail of blood. You see footprints in the sand. You may see difficulties But right after the difficulty, you remember the evidence there was a deliverance that followed every difficulty. How many can say, I'm I'm a survivor? I've come out of some stuff. I can look back and I can see that, you know what? I'm not going to worry about the storm that happened then. It'll happen again. I'm going to look back and say, if God delivered me then, he'll deliver me again. He's awakening their faith to remember the evidence, to look back at your life and see that if God did it then, God will do it again. If he delivered you then, he will deliver you again. Your problem is not you're thinking about your past too much. Your problem is you're not thinking about enough what God did and how he pulled you through. If I had time, I could sit you down and talk to you about what what trauma does to the hippocampus, the memory part of the brain, where we get stuck and we live just in the pain. Forget the whole story. I meet regularly with uh, convicted serial killer David Berkowitz. You probably know the name. Conducting a 100-hour case study. I started two months ago after I mailed him my book. He wrote me. And uh, I, I visit him as a behavioral scientist and as a pastor. We meet once a month in Shargun Correctional Facility. Gave his life to Christ in 1988. Been a Christian for 35 years. Now you might say, well, he's a serial killer. Listen, a gospel that's not powerful enough to save a serial killer is not a gospel at all. And we meet and we talk about his story. 
I've got another 90 hours to do with him. We'll be publishing my findings in about a year and a half to two years from, right, from now. We go back. We look at the story, the full story. Because how the enemy would love for you just to focus on a piece of it. Just a piece of it. Just the pain. Because pain has this way. When you live in the rush, the Bible says that the, the, the storm is calm. The sea is calm. Everything around the disciples is calm. But when you live in crazy long enough, calm is more terrifying than crazy. And you live in crazy. You don't know what to do when it's calm. Calm is scary because when it's calm, everything inside of you is raging, waiting for crazy to break out. God's saying, look, I made it calm. Every adversity that you come out of, my authority was greater than the adversity. When Joseph looked back, he didn't forget his past. With these poor physicians that tell you to forget your past. Forget your past. Just forget your past. How's that working for you, by the way? Does it work? We know the more you try to forget something, the more you solidify the memory of it. It's counterproductive. It doesn't work. And guess what? You can't stop living in your past because the past is living inside of you. It's not about forgetting it. It's about remembering what God did and taking that tragedy and realizing it's a testimony. But if you're not careful, that pain, let me give you this illustration. This is how pain works. Emotional pain, physical pain. If you're on an island and you're loving everything about that island, the Caribbean, your favorite drink, favorite music, favorite company, beautiful day, sun shining, but in the midst of all that beautiful scenery, you got a toothache. Only thing you focus on is a toothache. How many know what I'm talking about? C.S. Lewis said it this way, pain insists upon being attended to. Pain will hijack all your attention. Same thing happens with trauma. You go through trauma, all you remember is the trauma. All you remember is the knife blade against your neck, the smell of nicotine in your attacker's jacket, the feeling of panic. We forget that there was a rush, but there was a hush. And the hush was more powerful than the rush. I pray for people here today that they're only comfortable with the rush. Today, you would be comfortable in the silence. You would be comfortable in the norm. You would be comfortable in that place where God has said, I pulled you out. Now, now let me pull it out of you. And he would heal every traumatized person in this place. Stand up with me, Mike. If you can come up, please. Thank you, Mike. You are awesome. Can we give some love for Mike? And some love for the people in the back, the sound people. Awesome. We forget the people in the background sometimes, but they're important. Amen? Amen? In 1980, Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States, was in a hospital bed. Commander-in-Chief is out of commission. The country went on beautifully. Two weeks, your past has been gone. The church kept moving. But if the garbage men don't pick up the garbage, there'll be anarchy. <laughs> Thank God for the sound, man. Amen? They keep it moving. Thank God for the ushers. Amen? I have no idea how that relates to the sermon, but Holy Spirit will fit it for you. But you're here and you're saying, you know, I, 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 you're right, Pastor. I've been traumatized. I, I feel like I'm always waiting for a problem. I'm waiting for the cock to crow. I'm tossing, turning, constantly anticipating a problem to happen. The storm is, I'm on the other side of the storm. It's over. But it's not over here. If that's you, I want you to come to this altar. I'm going to pray over your mind. Pray over your brain. I'm going to pray God puts things back in order. He makes you whole. I'm going to speak wholeness over your mind. Pray that He awakens faith. I pray that you would step back into love, that you break the isolation. Maybe this is your first step in breaking the isolation. I'm going to make the altar call one time. And I'm going to hand it over to your pastor. I'm going to stand right there. Pray for those that come up and believe God for a breakthrough.